Hello, Daniel. Welcome back to the show. Morning, Leanne Brooke Tyler. Is this my third or fourth? This is my fourth time uh, on your show, I think. We shouldn't yes. say that. People are going to start to expect uh, expect things or suspect things, something like that. <laughs> uh, I think it is. It's, it's definitely third. It could be fourth. I, I think it is, actually. Yes. And... We have got, in fact, it may well be a slightly different kind of show to you before in that, well, who knows what's going to unfold, but you and I are in a kind of like, almost like a constant ongoing conversation about all sorts of things, life, the meaning of life, the universe, God, and often particularly around relationships and polarity. And so... We don't actually know exactly what we're going to talk about today, but it felt like it would be cool to just have like a back and forth conversation. I suppose in some ways allow listeners to be a bit like the fly on the wall whilst we geek out on one of our favourite topics. It's kind of about it, isn't it? it what, we started We started with this idea, explain it to me like I'm seven, which is hmm. what we do is build on on frameworks and ideas and it can get so esoteric and so complex that I was going to have you say okay try again but do it explain it to me like I'm seven try again and then I was going to do that to you mm -hmm. so that we could I, th I think our intention is the same which is like how do we reach people who aren't aren't already in this work in this world or have access to these these ideas how do we get them some benefit from being a fly on the wall so that we're not just off in esoteric land which is so mm. fun to do but you know we've got we got a mission here we do we do and uh i think we accept it too and i think what's also interesting and this is part of the what's brought us here is we potentially got um i mean within the audiences between my audience your audience like probably different um places they're coming from in terms of their understanding and of course within those audiences there's going to be a range too and I think there can be certainly for me and I, I suspect the same is true with you I tend to go to a kind of level of depth and abstraction where unless someone's kind of been like following all along until that point of the furthest depth it can be hard to kind of pick up the thread so I think for people no matter where they are along that journey of understanding all things polarity intimacy relationships there may well be a kind of like onboarding point in this conversation that isn't normally there yeah we you I mean I think you and I are similar to a lot of humans and that when we find a new idea or we're at the edge of our thinking, that's where we get the most hits of inspiration. We get the most like sweet brain juice to say it to mm. the sound. We get the most excited about things that are novel for us. And so we're out on the edge of our frameworks, pushing ideas and making connections and things that are inter interrelated where people are just doing, they're just hard working folks out here. They're just doing their <laughs> nine to five. And, and they come in to sit and be a fly on the wall and we're, you know, um, dropping stuff that makes us excited. But yes, this onboarding idea is is perfect. How do we get people real value from the stuff that we've spent so much time in? Mm. Well, I love what you were saying just before we hit record around that model, like three stage model of relationship that I, I hold as kind of like, not that it's necessarily a, a day to David David Dader invention, but it's certainly him that's articulated it in a way that um, I often um, use as a as a backdrop for different conversations. And then you were coming at it from a different place, a different naming. So I, I think let's just start there and like build on that as as our foundation. Yeah. So already I'm calling these things three three things I wouldn't necessarily tell a, a seven-year-old but we'll start <laughs> yeah the words themselves aren't exactly like seven-year-old friendly are they they're not they're not <laughs> they're not seven-year-old friendly in the slightest but mm. here they go anyway <laughs> we'll explain it to somebody like they're a, a 16 year old and then we'll dial it back so in this model of relationships there are three I, we'll call it three levels of maturity three levels of mm. of development as a couple 
the bottom level I'm calling tyrannical. And I really welcome you to rename that. I, I, I like tyrannical because it's so vivid and it's so dramatic. Mm. It really speaks to a lot of the pain that people project onto um, patriarchal 1950s oppressive male dominated maybe abusive relationships this, yes. this mm. that a man is a tyrant in the relationship and that the woman is subject to him and that the household is um it is his kingdom and he has the absolute power and he is corrupted by that power and he is therefore abusing people this is actually really in line with the feminist narrative that first a second wave feminist narrative it really saw the family unit in the west as a tyrannical unit and so i just want to you know not bringing my own values to it i just want to acknowledge that there are people who have been through tyrannical relationships they're going through it now and, and we have a place for them we can acknowledge that pain we can acknowledge that structure so let's we'll start there talk about that what's your experience with that mm. and, and by the way any anytime you want to rename something it's it's all it's all <laughs> I'm just thinking, I don't actually know if data has a has a label of that kind to reach these stages. I only remember them as like stage one, stage two, stage three. So this would be the equivalent in uh, David's, uh, David's, data's uh, framework of stage one, which, as you say, would be very much that 1950s stereotype. The, and I think what you're talking about there is, I guess, the the real like depth of shadow of of that kind of dynamic so you know like verging on abusive or even including abuse whereas i think it's helpful to recognize there's within anything there's going to be a light end of it and you know that which is why it can be hard for us to let go of something and move past it without recognizing oh it has got benefits and so for the relationships that worked within that that stage that kind of like way that everyone had a role people felt provided for had their needs met again like looking at through the 1950s stereotype you know men knew their role was to kind of go out and get the bacon bring it home the woman was looking after the house and the children and being provided for and within that there is kind of like shadow and light yeah yeah well you're <laughs> I'm tempted to call you out on jumping ahead with this. I think you're doing okay, th sorry. the uh, I'm gonna spoil the surprise is that this this tyrannical label of a level one relationship is actually getting it gets much more of a bad rap than it actually deserves. I think mm -hmm. that there, there were were and are a number of people who are experiencing optimum satisfaction living in this um what we are now projecting and labeling as tyrannical i think i think these these things get a bad rap because we're standing in the future judging through the lens of media and feminist criticism at the past and we've adopted and and to some degree swallowed a, a pill of an interpret an interpretation of these things that they harmed folks and i don't know that the harm is as pervasive as as i've been taught to assume mm. that's uh yeah i think that's like where is this not true that it's like always so much more complicated and um so many different shades than we look at if we just try and simplify it and I think that's why, I mean, I love I love the word tyrannical, but I think that's the that's the thing, isn't it? It's like that one end of that stage would be tyranny. And then yeah. there's another end that could be called benevolent. Yeah, yeah. I well, you're totally destroying my model. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you you came in knowing anything could happen. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 possible okay so what we've got is a three it's a three layer model right now and mm -hmm. so right now we're just describing that that level one um let's jump to level two and then we'll and then we'll brief on level three and then we can come back and analyze the whole cake 
and see if we can pick it apart and see if there's more distinctions and more fun we can introduce to it. So Great stuff. Level, level two, anarchy. Level two is the, the rejection of all roles and any, any kind of governance structure inside a romantic relationship is up for grabs at any time based on uh, how either person is feeling. There is no, um, no strong sense of a masculine energy or a feminine energy. There's no strong sense of a leader and a follower um, that you enter into a relationship and both are equal. Um, this is sometimes called egalitarian. That's that's one way to put it. So both are equal, both are contributing equally. Um, and that's where a lot of relationships in the West have defaulted at this point, especially mm -hmm. modern and progressive relationships. They are at this uh, anarchic or egalitarian stage of relationship. Mm. Yeah. So mapping it back to Dada's model, this would be stage two, which, as you're saying, is um, very much a model of rejection of what went before. And so where, the, where there were the fixed roles that were very um, created around this strong sense of like woman equals feminine, man equals masculine, and those come with very specific roles, it is a rejection of all of that um, and also can be seen as that stage one level is very codependent and stage two it's independent where this notion of you know anyone could do anything there is no sense of like an external well supposedly I mean we're humans so <laughs> it's quite hard to truly um until uh yeah until we go further into this model, uh, it's likely that we're still going to be, to a large extent, um, conditioned by outside forces, but seemingly it's, I will do what's right for me. I don't need to conform to a role because I'm a woman that I have to do certain things. Yeah, I'll, I'll do what's right for me. We'll do, even we'll do what's right for us. There's a real sense that a couple, if they bring a lot of intention to it, is crafting their own relationship structure, their own relationship governance, and their own relationship agreements, which brings mm -hmm. a lot of consciousness, um, a lot of attention, a lot of awareness to what a relationship is. It's inviting people in some ways to say, okay, what are my needs? What works for me? And how can I um, structure this dyad, this pair, this relationship um, in a way that is mutually beneficial. Mm. The which sounds really wonderful. And again, you know, looking at if we're allowed to go here, like with this, there's going to be a, a kind of shadow end and a, and a light end. It um, and I was just thinking personally, and also many of the the couples that we've worked with, I think. What's often missing, particularly at this stage where it feels as though it's such a progression on what went before, it, it can be easily missed that like conditioning and wounding is still going to be informing much of the choices. So it seems as though, oh, it's free choice. We'll just do what's right. And yet I look back at the way that I was in relationship and there was almost a a rejection of anything that looked like a traditional woman's way of being in a relationship without even really having a sense of whether my rejection was, was coming from a place of like, yes, because that's not right for me, or whether it was uh, wounding or a conditioning from that kind of feminist, like, well, of course I shouldn't be doing this. Therefore, it can't be right for me. Yeah. And I think that largely, whilst there's this kind of like consciousness, of let's examine what's right for us. I think there's so much still goes unexamined. Yeah. You point out one of the, I think one of the sneakiest psychological principles, which is, um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to articulate this well, but I'm, I'd like to try. Um, there's, there's a sense that people have freedom when they reject something that felt oppressive. However, it's the rejection of that that locks them in um, and they are just as much 
a slave to the rejection of a principle as they were to the adherence to it. Yes. That's mm -hmm. not school for a seven-year-old. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that language failed the seven-year-old test. Let me try again. Um, <clears throat> when people... Uh, when people say no to an idea and live their life based on rejecting it, they're just as much a slave to having to continually reject it as they were to having to continually abide by it. Yes. I may have gotten down to like 11 year old, 12 year old. <laughs> I was just thinking about to give another example and I was like yeah I think actually I could be going up again in age rather than down in age but I was thinking of it actually with the example of when when people get to like say teenagehood and reject their parents ideals as being like you know this isn't for me I'm going to reject that and rebel and then appear to be free, appear to be liberated, but are still making choices in reaction to, to whatever it was that they were rejecting from their parents' ideals. Yeah. The new rule, the new tyranny is that you must reject where you came from. Whereas the, yes. pre mm -hmm. the old tyranny was that you had to do what was what you were told. The new tyranny is that you mustn't do what you were told, which leaves mm -hmm. out all of the benefit of the previous way that you were all of the rules now um you don't get those benefits because you are actively and can and and have to reject all of those yes <clears throat> and Let whilst i go back to when i was like fully occupying that stage and the the kind of um elusive thing was that it there was this constant comparison of like but of course this is so much better like it can't get any better than this therefore any sense of this doesn't feel like it's fully working or I don't feel fully satisfied there must be something I'm doing wrong because the model can't be wrong yeah yeah. If if the model is I can do whatever I want now and and that's not working, then of course mm. it is to look at um well I must be doing something wrong because I can do whatever I want so it, it, so there must be something wrong with me that I'm because it can't be it can't be the model because the model has been completely demolished. Yes. The model is now mm -hmm. completely free. So why is this still- And what was before was clearly wrong and bad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this, it, what we're describing is bringing people to the end of their ropes with the anarchy type of, of level two relationship type, which is, and, and this is hard to see. This takes a lot of self-reflection because people are still sitting in this idea that they have freedom to do whatever they mm. want but they're sitting in freedom and misery because there's not clarity and there's not, um, th there's not um, a symbiosis, which brings us to level three, symbiosis. Yes, okay, which in data's uh, terminology is stage three, um, <laughs> as people may have guessed. And I'll wait. I'll let you describe what you're seeing about synergy, and then I'll I'll give the sort of data ish vibe on that. Yeah. So symbiosis is not where a lot of people are at right now. So there, mm -hmm. I would say that um, to approach this level of uh, this stage of relationship, you actually have to work your way through both pre both levels to some degree. You. Um, you have to explore the traditional doing what you're told. Um, there has to be some kind of rejection of that and some wandering in the desert. If we're going to use a metaphor from the Bible, this is the release from captivity into, into level two um, anarchy, which is the Jews wandering the desert is a biblical metaphor. And to come into the promised land, which is relation, a symbiotic relationship or relationship symbiosis, you actually have to go through those stages to work out what 
it, what has not been worked out. As you come into relationship symbiosis, you look back at the time in the desert and you look back at captivity and you have all of this information to pull from. And you could say, okay, I had tyranny. I rejected tyranny. I had freedom and freedom and was in its own way tyrannical. So what am I going to bring into my life now that is actually free from the tyranny of freedom and the tyranny of tyranny, the tyranny of captivity, the tyranny of tradition. So as people come into this symbiotic relationship model, what we find is a rediscovery of that tyrannical, some of the ideas that, that lived in that tyrannical level of relationship, namely that masculine and feminine roles create a symbiosis that fuels health and well-being in a in a romantic dyad in a romantic couple mm -hmm. so i'm going to name uh data's take on this she's very similar to what you've just said but then I, I think it'd be really interesting to explore what you've just said but we almost like have to go through those stages first um so from from the kind of david David lens on this it'd be it'd be really talking about union where and this of course we're talking about right now talking about it primarily I think from a heterosexual lens of there is a man and a woman and it is right for them when they are free from conditioning when they've you know at least are in the work of being conscious of their wounding that it feels right for the woman to embody I'm doing a terrible job of talking to a seven-year-old here but hey. <laughs> um, it feels right for her to embody the feminine and the man the masculine and from that there it creates a place of union um what what I found interesting in what you were just saying about we need to be able to have we need to have worked through the previous stages. I mean, the interesting thing about the state the stages are that these this is a cultural thing, as in the stages are happening culturally, but of course we can then inhabit those stages personally. And I was thinking. I don't know if most of us will have fully inhabited, certainly kind of like within those stages fully and then move to the other stage. Because for for those of us that are, um, you know, weren't around in the 50s, we likely just wouldn't have had the opportunity to have fully inhabited that stage in this lifetime. Would no. you agree? Yes. So how does that how does that work with what you were saying in terms of we likely need to have moved through the stages it's <clears throat> so th this comes back to and, and by the way i've just been dying this whole time to map this back to spiral dynamics and integral theory <laughs> of course but, uh, do you want to do that for a seven year old <laughs> it, it's over really wonderfully just just in that we have um pre-conventional conventional and post-conventional we mm -hmm. you know any point in, in spiral dynamics, you can kind of consider where the bell curve of people and any given people are, or where a, a person's consciousness is usually, or a person's attention, uh, attention and values are usually, um, that's their center of gravity. Uh, that's conventional. So socially, what's conventional in the West is anarchic relationships. It's, it's uh, egalitarian anarchy. Um, so what we're pointing to is post-conventional um, and and then obviously what you're saying is that many of us have come of age in a conventional, I'm going to start and say that again, many of us have come in age in a conventional egalitarian way of relating. That's what has mm -hmm. been promoted. Um, and we don't have a personal experience in our lives with a relationship tyranny type. I, I, we, we've not been in a relationship where I've dominated tyrannically. My my wedding, when I got married, I was 24. And we dove right into um, we dove right into this anarchic relationship. And we we knew what we were doing at the time to some degree because we were calling it egalitarian. We were um, evangelical Christians 
for which this debate was alive in that in that culture at the time, which is, mm. are we going to are we going to do traditional gender roles or how are we going to run this marriage? And so we brought some some awareness and some dialogue to it and decided that we were going to do egalitarian. We were going to do, there's no, no set leader. You're going to kind of be in charge of this area because you're better at it. I'm going to be in charge of this because um, I'm better at it. And this is the funniest thing about it is that our wedding song was Phil Collins, follow you, follow me. And I think that's... <laughs> <laughs> like I like that song and it just on it, it, it's an icon of this symbiotic egalitarian yeah. well guess yeah. what the theme <laughs> tune <laughs> for it <laughs> say, say that say, say again it's like the theme tune for it isn't it yeah follow you follow me um Honestly, I would I would say the lyrics, but that's the whole kind. Of, I mean, like that really encapsulates. <laughs> like, I will follow you. Will you follow me? All these days and nights that we know we'll see. I will stay with, with you. Will you stay with me? Just a single tear is passing here. Um, anyway, he's an English book. Maybe you've heard of him. I have indeed. I, I don't actually know the song. I don't know the song, but uh, I get the gist. I get the gist. What were you saying? I think I interrupted by saying is the theme theme, theme song. Well, listen, certainly my life is not how everybody's life has to go. Thank God. But um, in setting my relationship up like that, it also didn't work. It also uh, caused a, a lot of stress and a lot of tension um, and something that I would call maybe territorial confusion um mm. yeah. no... what's just come to mind is actually our very first probably our very first conversation certainly the very first episode we did together which was around um <clears throat> the work you were in at the time around you know dark masculine light masculine and I really remember you saying to me then how Oh, the exact language you use, but like how how that wasn't present. I think you used the word neutral. There's very kind of like the like no polarity, like very neutral in terms of both of your embodiment. Um, and that really stood out to me in that conversation that your your recognition, like oh, that was what was present. It wasn't this embodiment of conscious, like masculine or feminine. Um, yeah. So so the model that you're talking about is is like a uh, it's a graph where the top, the up and down is light and dark. Um, and then the left and right is masculine and feminine. Mm. And so, so map, uh, so kind of marking yourself on that masculine feminine, if you're right in the very middle, we were calling it androgynous. And then if we were, if we were talking about the dark and light, if you were right in the middle of that one, we had it at neutral. So you, if you were a zero, zero graphed on that little mm. plane, you would be androgynous neutral sexy <laughs> not real <laughs> I was joking <laughs> not a lot to push against there's not <laughs> that's like floating out there. um yeah 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 so um I'm trying to remember how, oh, that was it. You, you wanted to bring in spiral dynamics. Was there anything more you wanted to say about that? There's a lot that can map on here. I, I think the the thing as, as I teach this stuff and as I work it out, the thing that's most present for me is how easy it is for people to confuse um, symbiotic relationships that, that there's not a lot of examples of and there's not a lot of... Mm. Uh, language around and there's there's not a lot of distinction around a symbiotic relationship in fact i just made that word up i mean david data is pointing to it and he called, he called it level three what it stage three yeah um and i'm calling it union but i don't there isn't like a a name i don't think particularly <clears throat> right it's it's um obvious it's very obvious to me that people are uh actively confusing what I'm talking about with tyrannical relationships because yes. there's some similarity <clears throat> in the fact that we're reintroducing uh, gender gender roles. 
Yes, absolutely. And I think that's the... And I, I saw that recently, actually, on your um, <clears throat> on your TikTok. I can't remember what the particular video was, but you were talking about something along these lines. And I saw a number of people that were sort of saying things like, you know, how can I never see this again? And clearly project, <laughs> clearly projecting what you pr projecting that stage one a tyrannical view of relationships onto what you were talking about which through my eyes you were talking about this uh symbiotic way of relating and yet when that's not and it, it isn't visible to many people because as you say there's hardly any examples of it it's not even in um and again because we've so this is my own jam but because <clears throat> we've so so lost the um conscious working with an embodiment of the archetypes uh, gods and goddesses where we'd get to see these things um we look out there the mundane world and humans living in very kind of like limited ways and it's just not even it's not available to us as, as a possibility so of course we're going to take what we've seen and what we know and project it onto whatever we're hearing talked about so that's what happens it's that that understanding and for most of us going back to actually I think this is how we got here I was saying most of us wouldn't have personally experienced the tyrannical ty I feel like I'm missing a syllable tyrannical um <clears throat> relationship but we may have seen our parents or grandparents and so we're then thinking well we know that's wrong anything that sounds like it must be it and therefore also wrong yeah um but that's true. It's it's very easy to project, and <clears throat> more so. This this word came up, and I, I'm surprised that it hasn't been in my vernacular for longer. This phrase, social contagion, and all that means is that um, I've been thinking about this for for a while. You can talk to someone who's never been in a bad relationship with a, a talk to a woman who's never been in a bad relationship with a man who has a great relationship with her father. And simply because she is immersed in Western culture, she is on high alert and secondarily traumatized by the stories that she hears in, in media and social media. And there's, there's a social contagion aspect of this, um, of, of this domineering that is lingering in, in the air that um, it actually takes even it takes somebody who is not experienced firsthand trauma and has them on high alert to be traumatized and has them rejecting things that are otherwise supportive and healthy just because of the cultural dialogue about it. Mm. Yeah, which is interesting because as you were saying that, I was like, of course, you know, that's that's right for humans. That's how we've survived this long. You know, like it doesn't take every person in a tribe to have experienced that something's dangerous for the whole tribe to know it's dangerous and to avoid it. Like that, that's how we're meant to be so that we can survive. And yet there's times like this where it creates a reaction which isn't based in, um, truth necessarily or certainly what would be most um most true for that person the the stories that are the most sensational and dangerous and activating of the limbic system are getting the most attention mm. and these are dangerous stories that are getting outweighed and amplified over and above the stories of safety and union and love and devotion and so yes it's it's the the uh, honestly it's the the media commerce model of getting clicks for sensational um and scary things that has driven the amplification of of these kind of traumatic stories they fit the narrative and they are are as a result if i may be uh out of my depths to to do a cultural critique here they are toxifying otherwise very healthy people who have only experienced good things Mm. there's part of me that wants to say mm, yes I agree with that and 
is I would say it's a rare person and talking, I think we're probably talking more about women at, at this point, really. I think it's a it's a rare woman who hasn't experienced trauma that links to this um this danger. Yeah. I I tell you what I'm thinking of is my daughter. And I love I love her so much. And she's 14 and she goes to school and experience and is subject to the same kind of social interactions that everybody is. And so I'm sure she experiences rejection and and dismissal and domineering behavior from young men because that's uh I don't want to say this as an excuse, but that's developmentally appropriate for young men to try out uh behavior that's domineering and they're just not developed. They just don't have yes yeah you don't have a mm -hmm. sense of being responsible for people other than themselves and so they'll they'll prioritize short-term gains at other people's expenses so as bad as bad as it is it's developmentally appropriate for them to behave poorly and uh, unfortunately also for my daughter to experience um the other end of that now if i'm being totally fair she's probably developmentally appropriate to be shitty to boys as well and just you know, so we'll we'll say it cuts both ways. Um, so as much as I am able to be there in her life and support her, I know she's still got trauma. I think I I think the danger comes when the culture says, look at that trauma, look at it again, focus on it. That trauma is the most important thing in your life. That trauma defines you. That rejecting that trauma defines you. Rejecting that trauma defines all power structures and all power systems. De uh, rejecting that trauma should be how you structure your relationship. And so in that way, we see this thing play out where a young girl who is otherwise healthy has an experience of trauma that's amplified by the cultural dialogue. And so she rejects it and moves into an anarchic style relationship because that's the rejection of the trauma that she's experienced, which has been amplified by the culture. Try saying that to a seven-year-old. I'm not sure it'll land, but you know, we'll... <laughs> well, this is, I think it is helpful to look at this through the lens of our children. We both got a, a daughter and a son. Um, and it's interesting noticing my daughter bringing home um, stories and views that she's taken primarily from school and then kind of brings back into the home. And it gives us the opportunity to kind of like be in this, um, I guess, like just explore, like, you know, taken to its ultimate conclusion, what would that look like? And it's it's fascinating how she will where the narrative is it's so different to how it would have been you know even say 20 years ago i think it is such a focus on the the egalitarian model the anarchical model in in your language that it is really interesting seeing her come home and say like, well, no, because girls should be able to do that. And that's that sexist because that is whatever the thing is, you know, like it could be playing a particular sport or whatever the thing uh, or a particular job. And it's really interesting recognizing how, um, hmm, it, it's like, like bite-sized beliefs that are just sort of given, like, it's just like, that's true. Here you go. This is a belief to take on now. That's what I notice about it. It doesn't feel like it's got huge amounts of context. It's just these like bite-sized nuggets of, of truth that, um, and I think particularly for, for girls growing up in today's world who, do have this sense of like you know who they are and their gifts and their passion and what they might want for themselves and so of course it sounds great of like yes you can have it all and there is nothing that you shouldn't be able to have just because you're a girl and so of course it's like a kind of like yes I want to take that belief on with no sense of like what might be the the conclusion of that what else might that mean 
if that were true or if that were taken on board. And that's what I'm really noticing with her at the moment. Yeah. I mean, we don't have, uh, as, a, as a broader culture, what's not in the dialogue is the conclusion of, of mm. these things. Because yes. frankly, we're just, you know, I'll venture to say that, and this may not even be true, but it really, I've only seen this, this conversation start to emerge in the last five years or so, which is... Mm -hmm women who were told they could have everything saying, actually, no thanks. Like, actually, this is working against my biology and it's working against my physiology and my natural interests. Um, and it's coming at a cost to me that I'm no longer willing to pay. Mm -hmm. and, and because that's so new in the cultural dialogue, there's not a mean for it. It doesn't get taught in school yet. It's really just emerging from people who are able to reflect and be honest with themselves about the fact that, okay, I tried this experiment and I've come to the end of the rope with it. Now what? Mm. Yeah. It's just hit me how, how of the moment this is. Yeah. I think when... When you're so immersed in that exploration and that conversation, like you and I are, it's it's easy to miss like how how new all of this is. As in, like you say, there isn't even a meme for that, which <laughs> which says it all, doesn't it? Well, yeah, and and listen, there might be some memes, but you have to calculate that the meme doesn't fit the narrative, and so the meme doesn't get amplified mm. in the dialogue like you know for five years I've been hearing women who've come to the end of the rope with you know pushing them, their, themselves up the corporate ladder and embracing everything but how have you flipped on MSNBC and heard that meme elevated or flipped on any kind of mainstream news or any kind of place where uh, people are kind of in the bell curve of modernity and heard that idea really amplified in a way that doesn't mock it or um, or diminish it and I think <clears throat> I'm not a big lizard people, like uh, overlord kind of uh, societal construction. This is definitely not appropriate to seven-year-olds. <laughs> yeah, right. well, lizard people are fun. Lizard people, is a, that's a seven-year-old. Right? Um, I'm not one who thinks that we're subject to, uh, to vicious overlords in our social construction yet, though I may be, you know, I, I reserve the right to change my mind. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but there certainly is an economic reason to have women working. There certainly is a, a GDP, a gross national product uh, benefit to having both parents out of the house and producing income. Um, there certainly is an argument to be made that it is easier to control people when a family unit is weak. Um, there's an argument to be made that uh, two parents who are working and away from the household weakens a family unit. So there are there are a lot of reasons that this message may not be getting the amplification that that it deserves. Mm. Yes, it doesn't necessarily go in the interests of the current cultural kind of agreed on like this is what success looks like yeah. Yeah. Mm. both individually and also <clears throat> culturally right mm. and yet and just like you're saying you know the, the women you've spoken to and we have not even actually looked at it from the man's perspective perhaps we'll come to that in a moment but certainly I've had so many conversations with women over the last five or so years where one way or another they're re re realizing they've gone to you know some of them are very very successful women they are women who you would look at and say they they do you know the cliche of like having it all they have it all and yet it's taking its toll 
emotionally, physically, spiritually, certainly. In fact, it's interesting how it's spiritually in particular, and partly probably because of the work we do, it's the spiritual aspect in, in particular, that disconnection with soul, disconnection with spirit in, in particular, that is one way or another starting to show up initially subtly and then more and more clearly like this isn't the life I came here for it feels like it's a shallow uh, shell of something and I've 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 followed the rules I've done all of the things I was told to do I've taken all of the opportunities and here I am and it doesn't feel fulfilling I'm exhausted. I feel resentful of the fact that I'm doing, you know, the cliche of kind of, you know, the superwoman at work and then I get home and it's like down to me to do all the kind of running the house and the children and the rest of it. And that's one way or another, the conversation I have, particularly in that kind of first conversation or two with new clients, new female clients over and over again. Yeah, so so you see it firsthand how having it all is is exhausting and and an incongruent in some deeper soul and purpose kind of way. Mm. Because it's it requires it in order to have it all requires you to do it all which requires to a large extent kind of overriding dismissing disassociating from what it means to actually be a woman hmm. and what specifically does what do, what is a woman i'm not gonna ask you that um, <laughs> I a whole documentary on that yesterday what called what is a woman um what is it about being a woman specifically that one must disassociate from in order to do it all it would be a really long conversation for me to name, you know, all, all different parts of this, but I'll, I'll just do, I'll just name a couple of the big parts that I see often are the places it's most showing up. Um, one is the, like women are cyclical. We have our menstrual cycle, which is initially the kind of cyclical way of a woman being in life. And then there's a wider cycle of kind of like pre having a menstrual cycle and then obviously menopausal and postmenopausal and the world the way the world's been constructed particularly the world of work is very linear very masculine not really um, in any way observing let alone honoring that cyclical nature of a woman and so just speaking personally in the years where I was in you know very corporate masculine environment in order to be able to fit in, in order to be successful, I needed to do whatever I could to, like, as far as I could neutralize my cycle, to not have different parts of my cycle affect me mentally, physically, emotionally. I had to do what I can, could to dissociate it, push it down, you know, some women medicate it, do what we can to not experience the cycle. And we we can do that to a large extent not only does it cost us one way or another like which often then starts to happen in terms of you know extreme pmt really painful periods those kinds of things what we're what we're missing because this again is just not part of the conversation that women are having kind of handed down generation generation the the menstrual cycle is is one of the most powerful portals to a woman's kind of spiritual life as as we as we are allowed to reclaim that relationship with our cycle each part of the cycle is like a messenger is an archetype in itself it allows us to open to something deeper and but we don't even know that's available so we're missing out on this whole aspect of our soulful life by trying to like push it down and fit in. And so that's a cost that we're just not even aware of until after we've reclaimed it. So that's just one aspect of kind of what it means to be a woman. It makes, I'm not of course saying to be a woman means to have a menstrual cycle, but this is a really big part of being a woman that is just not present for most people in our culture. Yeah. Another, this is just a, another small example, and I, I literally could give so many, 
is a woman's body is is meant to be and is more sensitive than a man's body is meant to be sensitive is meant to be able to feel changes in the environment in the emotions of other people around us so that we can kind of tend care to give gather and in order to again be in a corporate environment that is kind of really disconnected from nature people needing to kind of like um be a certain way not necessarily oops not necessarily a way that is um <sighs> honoring of different people different experiences emotions any of this it requires desensitizing it requires armoring up it requires closing which allows you to kind of survive in the world of work you then get back home and you're closed and you're armored up and you're desensitized and it's really hard to feel um really anything that is really you know wonderful to feel in your life, whether that be your relationships with your partner, your children, or anything else. So it has, again, a cost that isn't visible because we, most of us haven't experienced that. You, you, that's brilliantly put. Um, it's reminding me of something that I saw yesterday where it was a post and someone, um, I, it may be somebody was highlighting this as a, something that doesn't work. But a woman was saying, what do I need him for? I don't need him. I, I have, I can pay my bills. I can, I have DoorDash and Uber Eats. I don't, you know, I can get my food. I can pay my rent. I can raise my kids. I can uh, ha clean my house and I have my career. What do I need him for? And it's this, uh, the cost of that is not visible. Mm. Because what it means to be a woman who is connected to spirit is not, there's not an archetype in popular culture for people to reference and to set the standard of what it means to be a radiant woman. Mm. Yes. And so if there, if we've erased the archetype of radiant woman in the broader cultural conversation, then girl, you're not missing anything, right? You yes. have a mm -hmm. you don't need him. But what if just out of view, there's this woman who is connected to spirit, who is flowing with her cycles, who is radiant and nurturing and soft. And it's actually that that's possible for every woman should she relax into it and trust and create a dynamic where she's cared for, provided for, and protected, if that becomes the standard, then there is, then the cost of this becomes quite visible. And the cost of doing it all becomes really apparent in that you're losing that radiance and you're losing the ability to, to transform yourself into that archetype of a divine woman. Mm. Yeah. And it, it exactly is that it's and this again is why I'm so obsessed with archetypes. It's we have to look to the archetypes because the that model, that embodied expression just is not there for most of us culturally to look to as a possibility. Yeah. And and we just have to say, just just as a what my lens is on this is that the cultural dialogue is fueled by what makes corporations money. Mm. And, and so if there is an archetype that's missing from the cultural dialogue, it's probably, it probably doesn't produce consumer demand very well. Mm. And so all I have to say is like, perhaps a radiant woman doesn't go, doesn't need to go buy a bunch of stuff. And that's why it's not useful for, uh, for corporations and media buyers to push that archetype into the world. And, and this is this is really where a, being disconnected from history and disconnected from the archetypes really comes at a cost because there's so much yeah. more that's pointed to with these things. Mm. So I've actually got no idea how we're doing for time, but my sense is we're we're coming up on time. We've we've been talking about the cost from a woman's perspective, and then I've given examples personally. I'd love to hear from your your side of things. What does that? What is the cost for men? Yeah, 
so so just I mean this flows really well into what we were just talking about, which is um, women don't necessarily know the radiance that's available to them because we don't have a cultural archetype. Mm -hmm. Similarly, men don't know the kind of honor and character and service that's available to them because there's not necessarily that cultural archetype either. And what the and this is kind of this is a little tricky because you say, what's the cost to men? Well, it's actually interesting because it's more work. <laughs> you know, what, <laughs> what's available to men is to step into service, um, into loving service in a way that's just not exemplified a whole lot. Mm. And, and you go like, if you're not there, you're going to say like, well, why the hell would I want to expend more energy uh, doing loving service to the people around me? Like, it doesn't make sense. That sounds uh costly it sounds uh draining it sounds exhausting um these are these are males who have not experienced the rightness and the congruence of what it means to align with that that energy that loving service and to be lit up by uh who they become in, in that role mm. and so it it's actually yes it's more quote unquote work to be a man who is aligned with loving service. Um, but there's a rightness and a trueness and an honor about it that is worth it at a level that far outweighs whatever it costs to show up for people. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Okay, it's actually really been helpful for me to see the kind of like the extra level of barrier that's there to move into that uh, third stage. But also I think it'd be useful to look at, and this links to the conversation I had uh, on the podcast last week with Craig Richardson about, it was based around a Bly quote that was something like, men, men are no longer known for the activities they used to be known for, something like that. And then the cost of that, you know, a cost of men not having that sense of like role and purpose and being honoured and valued for that, um, which I think to a large extent is what we see when we look at the, you know, how men are feeling, the rates of suicide and all of the, these different ways that men are struggling, which doesn't get huge amounts of uh, focus because the focus has been so much on women, but it it's very much seems to me that men are suffering from a lack of what you're calling loving service, even though moving into loving service seems like it would be the costly part and would be, just to be clear, it would be too. Um. Yeah, I, if, oh gosh, the, this is, this is the paradox of, of being a man in loving services. That's, that's exactly the medicine that you need to come out of mm. the depression. It's exactly the medicine we need as man, as men to, to rise from the muck and the, and, you know, being discarded and feeling uncared for. We don't need what women need. Like we don't necessarily need to go to therapy and talk about our feelings, though there's a place for that. What's actually needed in the male psyche is to have a place to push into the universe and to watch it push out the other end, as Steve Jobs said. You know, we need to see ourselves as the cause of something happening. And, and again, if I could just uh, go above my pay grade and talk about a cultural critique here, Corporations and large organizations have largely made it very difficult for an individual man to feel like he's pushing anywhere in the universe and seeing something pop out the other end because everything's kind of done for you. You know, a lot we don't hunt anymore. You buy a frozen a frozen package of things. You know, so even that day to day connection with the fact that I'm doing something that affects my family and that affects the world has been sanitized shrink wrapped and and told told the microwave it mm, yeah which links so so perfectly to that conversation i was referencing which was exactly that you know that it's not just the it's not just the skills or the activities themselves of say for example hunting it was all that that brought in terms of 
this the un, the context that was happening within but also the sort of softer skills that made that up the connection with the land the connection with other men um all of those things but the the thing that really hit me and I felt some real emotion as, as I was having that conversation with Craig and I can feel it again now is the way that it's almost like an unacknowledged cost, you know, like men not having that sense of um, a role and then being um, honored and appreciated that role. Like that comes at such a cost, but even more so because we don't acknowledge it. Yeah, I um, I would say that men thrive on acknowledgement, and and I've seen Jordan Peterson tear up about this. He be he says you know it's it's surprising how much one simple word of acknowledgement will do for a man who is down and out. It will completely it has the power to completely transform his experience and give him a will and a reason to live, and mm -hmm. and it's it's amazing just how little is available to men in terms of acknowledgement for who we are and what we do. Yeah. What just um, came to mind, and it might be a good place potentially to close the conversation. Um, as you know, so much of our work at Wake the World is based on kind of looking at ancient ways and then kind of how do we alchemize them for this modern world? So we can't go back to live as we used to, but we can learn a lot from, you know, 90 odd percent of human history and how we did live. And I was thinking as we've been talking, you know, talking about these like, you know, the masculine and feminine and how typically in a kind of indigenous setting, you would have the women that are kind of close to home here. And then the men almost like um, on, on the outside, like going out to hunt, coming back to the village and how that allowed like women, uh, women to be kind of like much more able to kind of be um open and receptive not feel this sense of needing to kind of armor up also provided you know the men the directionality and all of that and i was thinking it seems to me that because it is essential that men are doing what they did in that that life way the acknowledgement was just like built into the fabric it's like you couldn't not acknowledge something that was so fundamental to everything working. It would be, you know, it's almost impossible to imagine being a man in that kind of dynamic and feeling unacknowledged because you know that lives are literally dependent on you. The acknowledgement is like built right in. And that was just occurring to me, just thinking like, gosh, that we've come so far away from that, that um it's no wonder going back to what you're saying about Jordan Peterson it's no wonder like the simple word of acknowledgement would have such a such an impact when it's so missing now from the, the context yeah there's there's another thing that I want to do and and this is just at the edge of my thinking too which is it seems it seems as if there's a a segment of, of culture that has this type this dialogue this type of dialogue and said in the easiest way it's reminiscing over the good old days like we said oh wouldn't it be nice wouldn't it have been be nice to live in a way that we used to live and embedded in that is a sort of resistance to what is mm -hmm. and I, I guess I just want to I want to say that as we dance with these ideas and exploring gender roles and exploring um, mental health for men and uh, radiance for women, all of these things, I think it's really critical that we not just point backwards and say, wouldn't it have been nice if we could we'd do that again? But like, there is an unfolding of culture and it mm. may not immediately be in the direction that's healthy. So how do we, how can we just, not add resistance to it and still bring this wisdom into a, a new iteration of culture and, and to have it unfold in a way that we don't have to be the curmudgeons uh, who are saying, uh, no, this, this is all wrong. You know, we can, yes. this is coming at a cost. 
And this is how we're going to mm. handle this cost. And this is how we're going to counter it. And we're going to be with the unfolding of culture, even as it seems to not be supportive of our health. And we're going to just be with it and, and bring our medicine to it and not resist what's happening necessarily, but form it and co-create it and dance with it. Mm. I love that. I think there's so much there in that, as I was saying, we can look to the good old days which, you know, we could be talking 50 years, we could be talking thousands and thousands of years. Um, but to do so with a kind of no acknowledgement of like where we are now and where we are now is where we are now. It could be said that this is where we're meant to be. And so it's not ignoring our roots, but it's also not ignoring our present. Maybe this this might be edgy to say, but it, it's, it may be the difference between saying, feminism is wrong and should have never happened or saying what's the next wave of feminism mm. you know what's the evolution of this thing that has cost us some things and thrown thrown some uh thrown some kinks in the path perhaps um how can we take what we've learned and move it forward instead of rejecting it and and just pretending that we're, we're just throwing the baby out with the bathwater in a new way yeah yeah, I love that. So anything that you feel would be a, I mean, I don't think we've done a great job of making this simple for seven-year-olds, just to say, but I do feel like we've, we've been speaking at a level of um, oh, perhaps a bit more simplicity than we otherwise would have. But is there anything that you feel would make a um, honouring completion of the conversation? Hmm. I think one thing that's gone unsaid uh, for me is that for whatever reason, I'm doing work with men. I'm concerned about men, men being uh, honorable and whole and, uh, and acknowledged and healthy. For some reason, I'm concerned about that primarily for the service that it has to women and children. Um, and that sounds a little odd because we're talking about how little acknowledgement men get. And I, and I think that um, I can't change it. I can't, I'm, I'm just one person who's in charge of, of my own circle. And if I have a little bit extra, then I can I give that. Um, I, I think that men are best served by being in service. And maybe that's the best way to put it. Um, and so so yeah, I'm happy to acknowledge men. I'm glad to encourage men. The ultimate goal though, is to support the relaxation and radiance and spiritual sublimation that a, that a woman provides and to support the healthy growth of children so that we can live in a society that is more loving and more united. And, and that, our, that our survival needs are taken care of in such a way that gives us the luxury to explore spiritual pursuits and to connect with the divine. That's really that we didn't talk much about that, but that's underneath all of this is this ascension and connection to each other and to the divine. But we still got to put food in our mouths and supporting this unit, supporting the individuals in the family unit um, is a critical part of taking care of those things so we can we can let our souls uh, soar, so to speak. Mm. I don't think I can add anything more to that. That was perfectly said. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so for and this, this may well go out on your show, but for listeners from my show, where can they find out about your show? Um, so I don't have a show yet per se, but people can find more at speakwithdaniel.com. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. It was my pleasure, Leanne.